Bien, bonjour à tous, merci d'être venus si nombreux pour cette première séance le dimanche matin à 8h pour le compte rendu des ateliers. Et j'ai le privilège de, de présenter l'atelier numéro 1. Et let me shift to, to English. Uh, I have the privilege to be the rapporteur of uh, the uh, group on uh, the workshop on uh, finance and economics uh, under the chairmanship of Jean-Claude uh, Trichet. So in, in a similar workshop last year at the WPC, we had noted nine points of attention which, in retrospect, we found quite prescient. We had notably observed that even with the comfort of careful central bank policies, inflation prospects remained uncertain. And our jury had been out on whether the observed inflation surge at the time was transitory or would transform into sustained overheating. One year later, we have clearly moved to a regime of high inflation. This regime has been engineered as of last year by a combination of demand push through the fiscal expansions designed to alleviate the short-term cost of the pandemics and of a supply shock through disorganized supply chains and logistical hurdles. The war in Ukraine created another inflationary supply shock with dramatically higher prices of energy and food products. Our debate this year has pointed to some differences between the United States and Europe, with the demand component of the inflationary shock more potent in the United States, while in Europe, inflation seems more supply-driven, notably given Europe's dependency to Russia, Russian energy. It was observed that monetary policy is a poor instrument to react to supply-driven inflationary shocks because it does not act on supply, but can only restrain demand to adjust to the new supply equation. However, the reaction to this surge of inflation has consisted of a very significant, if a bit delayed, tightening of central bank policies, with the difference in nature of inflation between the US and Europe, justifying a more restrained reaction so far of the European Central Bank. Nonetheless, the core inflation in the US and Europe now seems remarkably similar. Two issues remained uncertain in our debate. One, we can expect post-COVID supply chains to work better, thus alleviating over time some of the supply chain constraints. How much this will contribute to reducing inflationary pressures remains to be seen. And second, the question is whether we are already or not witnessing a wage price spiral. Some participants argued that this has started to be the case, notably in the United States, or that it is coming soon. Others observed that wages had increased so far much less than the inflation. So the, the debate is still open on that ground. Clearly, however, the party is over. And we need to understand and adjust, and adjust to the implication of substantially higher interest rates. Our debate covered the following issues. First, monetary policy dilemmas. Central banks face a tough trade-off. If they tighten too much, they will plunge the economies into a recession that could be unduly severe. If they don't tighten enough, that might lead to infl inflation out of the battle with the risk of having to increase interest rates much more later on to correct for insufficient action. The group was overall rather convinced that central banks had acted so far with caution, wisdom, and adequate determination. Second, growth prospects. In that new context, everyone seemed to agree that 2023 would be characterized by a slowdown in growth and possibly by recession. Fiscal policies were seen as largely inoperant given the size of budget deficits and of public debts. There had been an extraordinary situation, now over, during which governments could accumulate debt and simultaneously see the debt service ratio actually decrease given the very low interest rates. The rise in interest rates left now governments without much margin of maneuver to sustain investment or compensate the poorer segments of the populations likely to suffer most from high interest rates and inflation. That led the group to note the political risk and the fragility of the social contracts, and these were mentioned as major concerns, 
with an open question of how to engineer the kind of social contract that would be conducive to a green transition, it was also mentioned that growth of GDP was not an adequate objective per se, consistent with the preoccupation regarding climate change and the green economy, nor with the preoccupation regarding social inclusion and distributional concerns, which are not included in the metrics of GDP. Third, financial market volatility. Participants noted the nervousness of financial markets where portfolio reallocations take place and assets are driven back now to more realistic values. Bubbles will explode. This is a high-risk situation, which is mitigated by the fact that banks in developed countries are much better capitalized now than they were in earlier crisis episodes, and by the role of the Financial Stability Board and the decisions taken so far by G20 countries since the Lehman bankruptcy. It was also mentioned that the weaponization of finance through the resort to sanctions against an economy of the size of Russia had implications on the assessment of risks and on risk aversion and could affect the possibility to meet the extraordinary demands for finance generated notably by the needs of the green transition. Fourth, ESG in the same spirit, how to allocate capital to green transition and social objectives, should we rely on autonomous private decisions driven by ESG concerns? Our debate was inconclusive, but participants insisted on the need for transparency and clarity and on the ultimate role of governments in providing proper regulation and taxation to support the transition. Fifth, period of strong dollar driven by the interest rate differential in favor of the US and by the exposure of Europe to the energy and war shock and again by the safe haven effect following the return of war in Europe. This is fueling inflation outside of the United States through imported inflation, notably in Europe and in developing countries where it can also generate credit failures. The discussion about the dollar also included questions regarding the prospects for the dollar as an international reserve currency. Sanctions could notably affect the perceived safety of holding reserve assets in dollars and in euros and could create incentives to diversify reserve assets. However, it was mentioned that the dollar could be expected to remain the major world international currency for the foreseeable future, though no date was given to define what this foreseeable future could be, notably given the lack of alternatives to the dollar as a reserve asset. Six, the situation of emerging and developing countries, which was mentioned as a source of utmost concern. There, they have been subject to capital flight, linked to reassessment of risk, increased risk aversion, changes in interest rates and exchange rates, portfolio reallocations, leaving them with a lot of difficulties to refinance themselves. Their debt situation is ominous. To the difference of developed countries, their debt service had already deteriorated, and this is now compounded by much higher interest rates. How to manage that situation? especially in the context of substantial investment needs, was mentioned as a crucial challenge that should lead to strengthening the tier one capital of development finance institutions to allow to bear first losses. In the face of the likelihood of a series of debt crises, the framework to manage this crisis is not in place. Given the rise of new creditors, including China, the Paris Club is no longer an effective coordination forum. The G20 has established a new common framework whose implementation, however, has been uh, disappointingly sluggish. Coordination across donors, both public and private, and with the, 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 the aim to avoid to coordinate only among the public uh, actors and then to impose a solution on the private creditors, was thought as an urgent challenge in need for prompt actions and decisions. We also discussed whether central banks should provide swap lines to ease the financial situations of emerging countries. The debate highlighted the risk of confusion and lack of coordination between, on the one hand, IMF facilities and, on the second hand, central bank provided facilities, and a preference to rely on the IMF financing facilities seems to have emerged from our discussions. Last but not least, 
food security, which will be addressed later in one of the sessions in this WPC, was mentioned as a crucial challenge in developing countries, which are confronted to a host of simultaneous crises, economic, food, political, security, geopolitical, energy, climate, and so on. Thank you very much, and I, I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues and our chairman, uh, who were uh, present in the discussion yesterday, can complement what I just said.